The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Our topic today, a January thaw in Burma. This month, following the new civilian government of Burma's release of around 300 political prisoners, Washington announced it was restoring full diplomatic ties. The move follows recent economic and political reforms that late last year prompted a congratulatory visit from U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. The government's recent moves have yielded favorable attention from other nations as well. The French and British foreign ministers have paid visits, and the EU seems poised to relax its sanctions against the country. But as Burma emerges from diplomatic isolation, the dynamics of life within Burmese society remains largely unknown to most outsiders. That's not the case for today's guest, however. Ingrid Yort is Associate Professor of Anthropology at UW-Milwaukee. She's been conducting research in Burma since 1988, including a trip earlier this month, which included a visit with Burma's most well-known citizen, opposition leader and Nobel laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi. Ingrid Yort, welcome to International Focus. Thank you very much. Well, I'm wondering if we could start with uh, just sort of a little background on the recent history of Burma. We, we, uh, we're talking about a former British colony and then independence came, 1948. And could we pick up the story there? Yeah, well, let's go to 1947 first. Aung San, who is Aung San Suu Kyi's father, was the architect of Burma's independence from the British. And he was assassinated in 1947, which left the country to um, gaining independence under Prime Minister Un Nu. And UNU uh, maintained the first parliamentary democracy in Burma until 1962 when there was a military coup by General Ne Win. And he held power until 1988 when there were uprisings and a violent uh, quashing of those uh, popular uh, uh, dissent by students, led especially by students. About 3,000 people were killed at that time, it's estimated. And uh, at that time, and then in 1989, the government uh, changed the name of the country and called it the Union of Myanmar. Um, so, so talk a little bit about <coughs> that. I mean, what was behind uh, uh, name change? Well, um, part of the, the name change, uh, Myanmar and Burma, Myanmar is actually just the written form of Bama, which is the, refers often, uh, was the British use of the word Bama, which is Burma. And um, Myanmar is the written form of Bama. So they're basically, they function the same. But it became politically significant because it was used as a form of legitimacy for uh, the regime. And I was there in 1989 when they made the change. And the New York Times uh, immediately accepted the name change and put it in the New York Times. And I remember reading in the newspaper in the front headlines the government saying, see, we're legitimate because the New York Times says that we're our name is legitimate. And so um, after that time, people became, uh, especially um, outsiders and uh, uh, onlookers of Burma, have wanted to maintain the name Burma so that we remember the history and the fact that it's an illegitimate government. The military regime has been in power since that time. So one of the longest uh, insurgencies in the, uh, in the country with ethnic minorities and also the longest uh, ongoing um, political rule of, of any country in the world. So essentially unchanged in terms of, of even one personality for decades. Mm -hmm. And in 88, when the government changed, <coughs> uh, we can assume it didn't change hands to any great degree. Right, Nguyen fell, um, although he was considered to be uh, a puppet master, uh, sort of pulling the strings behind the power after that. They changed the name to SLORC, the State Law and Order Restoration Committee. And that was later changed to the State Peace and Development uh, uh, Council. And uh, that was actually on the advice of a California uh, PR uh, group that said that Slork sounded very devious. So um, that got changed. But in any case, um, Thang Shui came to power, General Thang Shui. And he uh, then ruled basically after 1990 when there was an election that was held the first uh, since 1960. 
Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy party swept that uh, parliamentary election, but the regime refused to hand over power. At that time, the, the parliamentary election was actually not uh, designed to create a governing or ruling uh, parliamentary, but rather a committee, a parliamentary committee that would decide on the Constitution, since there wasn't a Constitution since 19. 74. So they were going to build a constitution, and then it took about 14 years, or you know, to to actually get to the point of making a constitution, and that's what happened in 2007 and 2008, and and the referendum in 2008 was what was pushed through, even during the storm cyclone Nargis, which killed 138,000 people in the Delta region. It happened right at the same time as the referendum was going through, the constitutional referendum. And the regime refused to um, postpone anything. And it was considered to be a sham. Um, and then followed by elections in 2010, which were also sham elections. People were um, uh, forced to uh, give their votes to the government. They were told that if they didn't, uh, they would be watched or you know, uh, punished. And now, even today, as we're looking at the upcoming by-elections in April, in which the National League for Democracy will also be participating, Aung San Suu Kyi will also be participating. Um, we're also seeing the same uh, military mechanisms uh, coming in to, uh, to try and force the vote in certain ways. So we, there's a kind of question, and even McCain today was saying that there's a question about whether there will be free and fair elections, and we should be watching that if we think about going forward with sanctions, which is one of the big issues for Burma today. So, uh, you know, we read there's there's been this spate of economic and political reform in the last few months, and as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, Hillary Clinton and some other leaders have, have visited as sort of a reward for some of these. What do we make of that? Well, I think that there um, there's a lot of um, hopefulness in being able to draw Burma into the kind of democratic fold, to bring them out of the cold. And some of the markers that have, the political markers that have been held out by the West to, um, to see that they actually are making steps towards a genuine democracy um, have been the release of political prisoners. Uh, and uh, they have had two uh, releases. The first uh, was in January 3rd. And um, there weren't very many that were released that were significant political prisoners. And so, uh, that was considered by Aung San Suu Kyi, as well as by the West, as being really not a good demonstration. So another round of releases was, was made again in, in January 13th. And um, that was done by decree of the president, Thane Sein, who, who, uh, unanim uh, who unilaterally uh, took that, even though there were hardliners in the National Defense Security Council who were against those releases. But, Certain uh, important political prisoners were released, in, including um, Minko Nain, who is, after Aung San Suu Kyi, the leading dissident uh, opposition, uh, and was part of the 88th generation uh, uh, student leader, who is extremely articulate about uh, rule of law and um, inspiring the people. And his name, Minko Nain, means the conqueror of kings. And it sort of refers to what is a, a, a very traditional um, mode of political arrangement, which is that in Burmese politics, it's always said at the back of Burmese politics, there's always kingship. And so um, when we think about politics in Burma today, it's, it's really useful to think about um, how the uh, rulers think of themselves as unilateral um, authoritarian kings like Thang Shui. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, your trip. You've, you've shared a few uh, images here. Uh, there you are, seated on the floor with, uh, with Aung San Suu Kyi. So tell us a little bit what's going on here. Well, um, Aung San Suu Kyi um, is uh, visiting here at the monastery where I do my research. And uh, uh, I had originally um, not intended to study politics, 
but I was interested in studying about religion and was located in monasteries. And that's how I, I met the first prime minister, Unu, because his entire cabinet had retired to the monastery. And all of the politics of state were really kind of happening at the monastery site, were going in and out. And so that's how I came to understand how politics was very much involved in the monastic and um, Buddhist construction of what political legitimacy is about. Aung San Suu Kyi is here visiting the um, monk who I've had a 30-year um, relationship uh, of, of uh, going back and forth to Burma and have known. Here her bodyguard is with her. I'm here with my daughter who also ordained as a nun at this monastery. And she's here to pay respects to, to uh, Upandita and often comes to visit. She's, she comes here for um, advice from him. Okay, well, there's another. I'm dressed in um, the traditional Burmese um, outfit. And as you can see, I'm wearing a similar um, style uh, shirt as Aung San Suu Kyi. In fact, it's kind of an outdated shirt. My clothes were sort of dated to the 1980s, but <laughs> apparently it's now considered Aung San Suu Kyi style. So when I would go through the markets in Burma, uh, I would have people who would actually stop me and take out of, of their pocket pictures of Aung San Suu Kyi and tell me how I looked just like her. So there was a kind of interesting um, way in which her even clothes had become politicized. Uh -huh. This is here with, uh, I, can't, I don't know if you can see it so well, the monk there, um, and two nuns, and then Aung San Suu Kyi and myself. Well, and uh, let's talk a little bit about that, uh, the, the relationship between the monastic orders and the political life, and just the other sort of centers of power in Burmese society. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in, in Burma, the, um, if we think about the politics of legitimation there, one of the things is we have a kind of exterior international um, politics of legitimacy making, which has to do with measures about democracy. And these are the measurements that are important to the international sphere. But internally, domestically, um, the important thing about legitimacy has to do with um, Buddhist politics. And so what we find is that um, the monks have a tremendous role to play in giving legitimacy to the regime. And so I've been tracing that since the time of Unu to Nei Win and then to Tan Shui. And in between that time, also uh, General Kim Yunt, who was uh, the secretary one in the 1990s and early 2000s, who was later put under house arrest by Tan Shui. Um, and uh, the, the way in which Buddhism has shaped politics in each of those um, generations of military leaders um, has, has been somewhat different, but they all focus on the, the one central idea, which is that in order to be a ruler, you have to have, um, you have, to have something that's called Buddhist pon or potency. You have to have a kind of spiritual potency, and that can only be gotten by giving things to monks, by supporting the religion. And so um, what we see over time is that there's been many kinds of strategies for how to deal with the monastic community. And Tang Shui, who, um, if we remember from 2007, when the Buddhist monks um, protested and marched by the thousand, that he um, took a long time, actually, to um, clamp down on the monks. But in fact, at that time, uh, I was contacted about two days into the Monks March by the New York Times reporter um, and Seth Maidens, who, who said, uh, you know, I, I'm doing uh, an article for the New York Times, and it's called Burma's Militant Monks, and I just want to get a quote. And I said, well, you're not going to get one from me because you've got it all wrong. And if you quote that, if you say Burma's Militant Monks, you're going to give the government um, the uh, ability to clamp down on the monks for being political. Monks aren't allowed to be political, but their actions were actually being treated by them as acting for compassion, concern for, their, for the people. But if it got placed into a political context, then the regime could say, oh, the monks are doing politics, and they're fake monks, so we can clamp down on them. And so they marched for another, Seth Maidens listened to me, and he changed the article. And the monks got to march another 27 days. And I really do think that we have to, to be aware of the impact that we have in framing things in the international sphere that may be treated in a different way domestically. Well, great. And uh, we're going to get more into the sort of geopolitical context of all this yes. after a short break. We'll be right back with more international focus. 
The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're talking with Ingrid Yort, who's just returned from Burma. Well, uh, a lot of the discussion lately has been around sanctions, the lifting of sanctions, and uh, so let's talk a little bit about that now. Uh, you mentioned uh, Senators McCain and Lieberman were recently there. Uh, first of all, what, what was the origin of the sanctions? When were they put in place? They were put in place for the last um, third and a half or maybe 20 years, um, and they were meant as a kind of effort for regime change, but they actually didn't have that impact. Um, and so they've, there's been a great deal of controversy in the um, academic and the you know, uh, international community about whether they're effective and whether they should be used. Um, there's also been a kind of dispute between the State Department and Congress, which has had different approaches to thinking about um, putting in sanctions. But in any case, um, <clears throat> the point is, is that at this point, I think there's a real readiness. Um, both, um, of course, the, the Burmese have been interested for a long while now to have the sanctions lifted. And, and what does the opposition say about sanctions? Well, they have um, been the ones, um, Aung San Suu Kyi has been the main proponent for keeping sanctions in place. When I spoke to her just recently, she said, well, we need to readdress these as, as as things change, and she thinks that the Thane Singh government is moving toward um, making uh, real um, changes, and she would like to uh, to think about reconsidering. She said that some of the things that need to be considered is political prisoners have to be released, um, that there needs to be a kind of resolve of the of the um, ethnic minorities conflicts, especially the Kachin action that's taking place now, and also um, she is very concerned about rule of law. Uh, that that the Constitution actually is not uh, does not have rule of law. It's very arbitrary. It does allow. I mean, 25 percent of the seats are taken by military, just structurally, and in fact, the the um, the main players are part of the National Defense Security Council. Eleven of those members, ten of them are hardline generals who all have fought together in the Shan Front and who are known to each other in, in a close circle. And they're the ones who are really calling the shots. So we're really seeing that even though we're talking about having a democratic election and we're talking about having a new kind of um, civil society apparatus as well as you know, in, new institutions, they're actually not different from anything that has been in place before. So on the Burmese side, obviously, the, the regime has an interest in having sanctions removed for obvious right. reasons. Uh, on the US side, what, what is our stake in uh, in Burma <coughs> other yeah, than you know sort of the the altruistic or supporting democracy and and self-determination but well it's it's been a strong um, logical battle and one that has been fought mainly through sanctions but in fact there are real st strategic political reasons um, or having more of a hand of influence in Burma because we've been hands off uh, in Burma China has taken uh, a great deal of, uh, well, the majority of economic control of Burma. In fact, the city of Mandalay is almost completely owned by Chinese at this point. Um, and the major um, industries have been taken by China, followed by Thailand, and then also India, which was, you know, the world's second largest democracy, was going to um, maintain its, uh, its, its high morals, but realized that strategically they had to create a bulwark against China with regard to the Andaman Sea, I mean, the Bay of Bengal, and so on. So they had to um, actually get more involved in um, uh, working with the Burmese in terms of um, uh, constructive engagement, as they call it, as compared to sanctions. So now we're seeing that there's a, a, a bigger interest in, in being able to use it as a face-saving measure, I think, for both sides to be able to open the country up again so that, um, so that there can be some economic flow. So yet again, there's, there seems to be a, a Chinese aspect to the, yes, the story. Yes, there is. Well, and, and what are those sort of markers that, that we've put down formally or informally for, uh, you know, are they well aligned with what uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has said needs to happen? 
Yeah, I mean, they're also looking to Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, uh, President Obama uh, made a phone call to her before he made a statement at the ASEAN conferences that he's, um, and also um, Senator McCain has said that uh, even though they don't want to give her a full veto power, they, they are looking to her first to see uh, what she says about lifting sanctions. Um, when I spoke to her a couple, um, a couple weeks ago, she said that, you know, she was quite um, willing to, to look at that and reevaluate, and, and I think she's interested in moving forward. So, given her status with the West generally and Washington yes, in particular, uh, what is her relationship with the regime right now, do you think? I think that she, um, she said that she likes Thane Sein very much. She thinks that he's a genuine reformer. Um, she said that she is concerned about how genuine the uh, desire for change is by other um, elements within the military. There are a lot of hardliners who are um, constantly fighting in this council that I mentioned um, with regard to letting the prisoners go or, or making these moves, feeling that, uh, feeling that the, the real control is going to be lost. Um, so I think we're watching a kind of shift. I think, I think that what's going to happen is we're going to move away from a kind of military hardline approach, which, you know, throw all the dissidents into prison and instead take a, a, a different, softer approach in which you don't have um, a d direct personal authority authority uh, for, um, that, that an individual takes responsibility for in the way that Don Shui's regime, everybody could always point the finger to him and say, you know, he's, he's responsible for everything. Here it's going to become um, much more diffused as they start sharing um, with, um, power sharing with institutions, civil society institutions, which I saw a tremendous number had grown up since I was there just two years ago. Um, a lot more of these on the ground um, capacity building, and um, that's also involved and spearheaded by the monks. So there's some real important changes that are going on that I think are going to change the dynamic of one military unitary rule, which was how it has been under Thang Shui. Well, could you talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the, the sort of centers of power within society? You certainly mentioned the, the sort of Buddhist establishment and certainly the, the military, but who are the mm. others? Well, in Burma, they've always said that there were three sons of Burma. There were the student, um, the students, um, the monks, and the soldiers. And the students protested in 1988, the, the, the monks protested in 2007, and the Burmese are always saying, when is the military going to stand up for us? Um, at this point, the military has become a kind of society within society. They, because of crony capitalism, they and uh, the fact that all of the the um, economic goods. I mean, Dan Shui uh, uh, privatized and sold off all of the the uh, companies and private uh, all of the assets of the state to private interests, and that's all owned by these these military people and their families. So we are looking at um, a kind of hierarchical class system that has emerged that really wasn't there 20 years ago. And uh, in terms of just demographics, there's rural versus urban. What's the population? Uh, well, um, I mean, some. I think the important uh, we, the ethnic groups are mm -hmm. a very key um, issue. I think you had a, yeah, a slide of uh, that gives us something of you know when when Burma first attained independence in, in 1948 um, on the eve of independence, uh, 14 ethnic groups uh, uh, created armies and. Uh, opposed the, the central government. So Burma has, since 1948, been constantly contested as a state, even though its borders have, have by, by colonial you know, decree already been marked off. But a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now with regard to the ethnic minorities is about the creation of semi-autonomous zones, because we're really talking about the economics of these regions. So, for example, the Shan are concerned with controlling the opium trade. The Karen are concerned with the border trade with Thailand. The Kachin have a very lucrative timber and jade and uh, uh, control with and, and business with China. And so these borders that have to do with the economy are really, it's not enough just to have them be brought into the legal fold, as the government would like to say. Um, these peace agreements are really business agreements. Uh, well, so uh, we've got just a few minutes left. 
Uh, what are some of the things that uh, we should look for to see if, if the process is legitimately moving forward in a, in a meaningful way, or is this window I dressing? That, I think that we need to not be um, naive about the past um, uh, political arrangements that have guided the country, and to not think of democracy as a kind of top-down blanket uh, you know, transformation. We still seem see the very same entrenched military power that is um, that is, that is still operating there. They have a constitution that has not actually changed. Um, the elections are still um, going to be, uh, I think, sham elections that are coming up. So, because we see the 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 mechanisms for how they're going to, they're they're trying already now to win the vote. Right now, they're saying to people, "We'll give you electricity if you vote for us." You know, they're, they're, so there's this kind of trying to buy the vote thing. So, I think that um, you know, we need to look beyond the veneer of what it means to say there's a democracy that's come to Burma and really see in a, in a kind of hard-faced way what it is that the regime is actually doing in terms of changing their, their government, um, especially with regard to rule of law. Well, thank you very much for a, a all too rare glimpse inside of Burma. To our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.